Hello. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Still got to work on these uh, home setups as uh, TMVS is is uh, virtual the next couple of months. Um, I'm sure we'll still be doing Zoom, uh, but, you know, get some new microphone situations and stuff like that. I'm just waiting for people to show up. Um, when you show up, let me know how you're doing. Uh, we're, you know, still in New York. It's pretty intense. Uh, it's a weird split because there's definitely a good chunk of people that are, I mean, you've got your people that are in home, they're self isolating, kind of doing what, you know, what we're doing. Then you have a bunch of people who kind of don't seem like they still really get it. And then of course, a whole like, you know, people who still have to go to work no matter what. And they're being put at risk, obviously. Um, but a uh, bunch to talk about. I'll take your super chat questions as always, of course. Um, and uh, smash the like button if you haven't yet. Smash subscribe. Uh, let people know. And first and foremost, this is definitely a great time, uh, if you can, to go become a patron at patreon.com slash tmbs because folks are gonna want a lot of content. <laughs> and there's also, uh, yeah, I was wondering, usually there's a lot more comments. Here's everybody, uh, appreciate it. So uh, yeah, subscribe to TMBS on Patreon right now if you can, this would be a really great time if you have that ability to do it. Um, if you're a patron and you need any sort of deal or anything to stay on, just message us and of course, uh, we give all three shows a week and now more shows a week to people at every patron level. It's just if you're at 21 and above, uh, we do Skype calls and stuff and some other things um, because people who can join at that level just helps us move the show along. So that's the pitch. Hit me with super chats for the questions. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, but I'm also just going to kind of hang out with you all a little bit. Um, how's everybody doing? How's everybody feeling? This is a lot. Um, I know that, you know, this is a moment of love you back of, uh, you know, great intensity. We're really getting a lot thrown at us. It's incredibly real. Um, this is definitely a moment where, yeah, how is everybody going to pay rent? There needs to be a national net rent freeze. There needs to be any number of really serious um, policy interventions and ideas and innovations at the global level, at the state level, at the local level. Maybe I'll talk about that a little bit before I get to the book. Um, I do want to talk about the book, though. I will just say, uh, uh, against the web, the cosmopolitan answer to the new right, a cosmopolitan answer to the new right is available for pre-order. It's coming out April 28th. Go to Amazon, go to Pals, go to Red Emma's, which is a great independent bookseller in Baltimore, and give it a pre uh, If you want to... Um, yeah, pre-order it. That's the way to pre-order it. I'm not sure about an audio book yet. I know on Amazon, you can also order it for Kindle. Um, I think like what, I, what I've been really wanting to think about more and more, and what we're definitely gonna do more content on is the idea of global interdependence, national power and national systems uh, of social democracy and empowerment uh, and serious local resiliency and micro um, and micro organizing, right? So we just look at this crisis, the reality of the pandemic. This is not a Chinese virus. This isn't a devil from overseas or any of these kind of like hyper nationalist narratives. It's a virus that was spread through the pathologies of global capitalism. It's threatening every single human being on earth. 
and it requires a globally coordinated response without a doubt. Now, of course, borders are gonna be closed right now. There's gonna be all of these steps put into place, including some profoundly dangerous steps against our civil liberties, uh, which we have to be extraordinarily careful and thoughtful about. Um, but there's also this element that this is, a, this is one of those moments where the earth needs to come together. There needs to be synchronized movement and people need to recognize that we are profoundly interdependent. We're in this together. There is no South African version of the virus. There's no Brazilian, there's no French, there's no Chinese, there's no American. We are human beings facing a very serious common threat which arises from our shared pathologies and problems, which is our global environmental problems, our, uh, you know, um, environment, uh, global capitalist problems, distribution problems, overconsumption, all of the things that have led us to where we are. And then on the other hand, in the United States, I mean, right now, Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump are divvying up Rashida Tlaib has done an incredible, incredible, incredible job of moving forward with a real stimulus plan, but that's nothing that's been put on order uh, from, you know, Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden just literally isn't even around, right? Like literally isn't present during this time of extraordinary crisis. And it proves again, I mean, it's just the Bernie agenda. We need single payer. We need healthcare for all. We need radically increased investments in our healthcare system. We need everybody to get 2000 a month. We need a freeze on rent. We need a freeze on mortgages. People should be looking at uh, things like, people should be exploring ideas of how they can come together with fellow renters and other people um, to say, in fact, they are gonna forego possibly uh, you know, paying rent as an example. People need to, you know, look at where they're organizing and democratic possibilities. And then third, we need resiliency built into the supply chain. Food needs to be local. Systems, uh, electricity needs to be localized. There needs to be a great deal more accessibility and power um, for essential uh, services to not be highly outsourced, right? So I think like those are the three things that I want to kind of play with um, in terms of thank you, Peter, in terms of in terms of all of this. Uh, and definitely, of course, all of these systems need to be renewable and green along every line, every part of the supply chain. I think um, one of the themes in the book that's actually really important right now is this idea of a positive cosmopolitanism in the sense that we need a model for being global um, and for answering the right that is actually affirmative and inspiring and recognizes our shared values and common linkage, right? So one of the things that I really looked at in the book was definitely how the IDW and the new right and the populist movements as well, even though they all are very, you know, in some ways they're very different, although the IDW is still useful to look at because even though it's dead as a brand and people aren't excited about these guys anymore, people from Sam Harris to Jordan Peterson represent a range of right-wing opinion and kind of naturalization. Thank you so much, Pat. Here we go, now we're cooking. They represent a range of normalizing right-wing uh, opinions, whether it's naturalizing economics, whether it's mystification about how hierarchies work or things like that. And that's the sort of frame at which we're looking at the IDW and the new right and the populism in general. And then, of course, there hasn't been a compelling left-wing answer to this. A lot of the answers, a snap election, a snap election movement for every office in 2022, I'm down. Um, that's totally Cat Stevens. Pat is the man. So that, you know, there, 
we had this fight basically between the kind of IDW and a woke culture. The IDW people would forward racist and sexist narratives. Then there would be this kind of generic woke culture, which would scold people and call things out, sometimes absolutely correctly, sometimes wrongly, uh, mostly correctly, but not with like a compelling alternative vision of how we actually do globalization, how we actually do pluralism. And I wanted to retrieve this word cosmopolitanism, which kind of means, you know, it has a sort of bad ring to it. It's kind of like, you know, people who live in London and New York and are really privileged and they like to eat sushi or whatever. But there's actually a deeper cosmopolitanism, which really looks to how we um, have common values that are universal, but not chauvinist, right? Like they're not Western driven. They're not Eastern driven. They are absolutely universal. And the reason that we know they're universal is because we can root them in all different sources, right? So that human rights discourses come from every corner of the globe. And I used Amartya Sen uh, to talk about this. I think that, um, you know, this cosmopolitan idea is gonna be really important and something I'm gonna have to do a better job spelling out because the left needs a positive vision uh, for how to answer the right right now, particularly in this sense of kind of like people wanting to contain themselves and close and space and boundaries and borders. Is air and noise quality better in New York with the quarantine? Do you need any supplies? I've got literally tons of beef and corn. Stay strong, everyone. Medicare for all. Thank you so much, Kowalski. You're the man. Honored and appreciated. You know, honestly, I mean, look, I'm pretty much in my apartment. I'm, I'm trying to take this really, really seriously uh, because I think, you know, frankly, if we took this seriously and Trump wasn't such a criminally negligent fucking asshole, uh, this could have been averted at this level, right? Like if, if we actually all stayed in, in January and February. Now there's a much bigger structural problem here, obviously. Kowalski is an awesome person. The structural problem is that we don't have public health care systems. We've to totally starved healthcare in this state, in this country. We've, you know, created an opportunity for a pandemic and for emergencies, you know, structurally through neoliberal policies and gutting the state. But even just on the level of people have been socially isolated and they haven't been given stupid information, this could have been slowed down. So I'm trying to play whatever part I can in slowing this down. Uh, which, you know, obviously as an individual is nothing, but if you collectivize it and magnify it, it can mean something. So everybody, if you can, if you're not being terrorized into work, stay inside, uh, self-isolate at these times. It's really essential. What is the U.S. medical debt situation going to look like after this is all over? In the Great Depression, people have nothing, but I don't think they're in giant financial holes. Well, the next step after this, I mean, from on a, you know, again, it's hard to talk policy is that, you know, because again, right now I'll keep reiterating, Bernie Sanders is leading. Bernie Sanders is putting forward great stuff. Rashida Tlaib, who by the way, she just got a challenger in her primary and we're all gonna need to fight like hell to keep Rashida Tlaib in Congress. It's so goddamn important that Rashida Tlaib stay in Congress. Rashida Tlaib has put forward a great package, right? And of course we've heard some good stuff uh, from various people. But the thing is, and, and Bernie is doing an incredible job leading, but the Democrats have no, they're doing nothing. I mean, Nancy Pelosi had all the leverage in the world to sit down with Donald Trump a month ago or even a week ago and say, listen, motherfucker, you were totally negligent. You have no idea how the hell this works. You've put everything in danger. We're about to go into a massive Great Depression style recession and here are the terms. But of course, she's more concerned with fighting off progressive proposals and being in whatever, you know, unbelievable, I can't even begin to comprehend the absolute delusion and incompetence and just utter corporatehood that defines Nancy Pelosi. But anyways, my point being is that after this happens, there needs to be jubilees. I mean, we need to get rid of medical debt. We need to get rid of student debt. We need to start over. We need to get back to that classic concept of the Jubilee. There just needs to be massive personal debt forgiveness across the board. We need to reset. We need to evolve. We can't keep having an indentured servitude economy, period. Um, 
The right never seems to stop pulling itself further to the right. Wing pseudo intellectual spheres from William F. Buckley and Alec to IDW today. I still think, I mean, one of the things that's funny about this book is like, look, if I put the book out in 2018 when everybody was talking about all these guys, it would have been great. Obviously, it's a little bit dated and that's great. I'm glad that the IDW is way less powerful than it used to be. Um, and I'm glad that there's less, less brand power. But I go over the arguments of kind of the big three in the book, which are, you know, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, and Ben Shapiro. And those different styles of neoliberal and right-wing argumentation aren't going anywhere. And that strong, strong, strong impulse to naturalize hierarchy instead of historicize it is still going to be a core split. And the completely insufficient, insufficiency of standard moralist liberal narratives to answer any of this stuff, whether we're talking about the IDW or the more kind of sinister populist right stuff. Um, small donation on behalf of a person who's sleeping in their car but wanted to donate, wishing you the best, my friend. Oh my God. I. <sighs> yeah. I mean, and as I keep kind of alluding to, I mean, it's hats off, Aisha. It's just so obscene. It is so obscene. The whole point is that we get rid of all of this bullshit preventable suffering, which totally doesn't need to happen. We don't need to have a single human being in the car. We don't need to have a single human being that doesn't have health care. We don't need to have a single human being that doesn't have access to public parks, that doesn't have a great home. All of these things can be universal, provided for, absolutely no problem. And then human beings can actually grow and explore themselves and deal with complicated suffering, deal with actually being human. I and mean, that's another thing that I kind of am hoping that doesn't go to waste in this crisis. I mean, there is just the terrifying political, you know, reality of where we're at. But there's also um, the idea that if you have this opportunity at all, that you should be doing and we should all be doing some introspective work because there is something to do with how we are and who we are that correlates with this political crisis. Um, and that's why the internal questions matter. You know, the stuff we talk about with Joshua Kahn, the stuff that you you know, do read about or understand in a philosophical, religious, or scientific context. We need to ask, what are the compatible mindsets? What are the compatible, you know, value sets and ways of looking at the world that can really meet the political moment, meet the social moment, upgrade this sort of human capacity right now? So that's, that's you know, part of the dialectic as we need to be getting into. I mean, these bailout bills are pure corporate coup bills. We know the Democratic leadership has totally failed. We know that the Republican leadership is vicious, authoritarian, and extraordinarily dangerous. And we know that we need uh, to build our ways out of these things. And But there's also going to be a consciousness that goes along with being able to pull off things like Peter Kropotkin's mutual aid that Shrekko and I were talking about the other day. Idea for a bumper stick for a sticker uh, for a bumper sticker shirt, a political slogan, get rid of preventable suffering. Senor Mikey Brooks. <laughs> you know, I don't know how great a bumper sticker it is, but in some ways it really is just that simple. All of this stuff is total preventable suffering. And we're at a stage of capitalism where we actually have devised greater and greater systems to actually incentivize that suffering and profit off of it. Whether we're talking about various debt servicing industries um, and all these other, you know, essentially kind of like loan shark and parasite, uh, you know, industries like, I mean, obviously look at the healthcare industry. It's a pure, unnecessary, pernicious parasite, which gets in the way of just government delivering everybody healthcare. There's nothing complicated about it. And it could be solved instantaneously. If it was a question of basic human well being and delivery, the Rashida to Live plan would be passed immediately. And Bernie Sanders obviously would be well on his way to being president. But, you know, we have a ways to go. Um, I think that, uh, but I think folks should be thinking about, you know, meditation, uh, different types. Types of reading, 
different types of even as we're gathering virtually, like what kind of conversations do we wanna have? How can we both be very serious and very attentive now at an extraordinarily dangerous moment when most of the national political leadership is either corrupt, hugely dangerous, predatory, or just utterly exhausted and failed, you know, covering the spectrum from Trump to McConnell to Pelosi to Biden. Uh, but then at the same time, obviously, there's these rays of hope and possibility with Sanders and Talib and so on. Uh, you know, how can we seriously engage in that? The Sanders campaign's doing incredible stuff. They're basically turning their campaign into, you know, a kind of rapid response and solidarity building with Corona. Thank you for your work, One Love. Thank you so much, Heather. So I think, you know, honestly, I wish I, you know, I sh I, I'll have a more structured introduction to the book uh, tomorrow, but I do think at some level, like, we really need to have this cosmopolitan conversation. We need to figure out a way to really understand global interdependence and really get it as actually a much more fun, dynamic and appealing way to be. Um, and, and that's what's covered in the book. The book also definitely has, you know, there's the chapter on Jordan Peterson, the dragon who didn't do his homework. There's the Sam Harris chapter, which is that the history is completely irrelevant. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, you know, and then the uh, Ben Shapiro chapter is Ben Shapiro and other dishonorable mentions. Um, and the, the first chapter is really an argument about this idea of returning to history because so many of these arguments, again, on the right, but even on some of the sort of like woke scold arguments, there's no historical contextualization and there's nothing more important than that for building a genuine humane and left project. You know, I always thought, and I quoted in the beginning of the book, the great uh, Cape Verdean revolutionary Amaklar uh, Cabral, who said, you know, he talked about colonialism as something that took Africa out of history. And the idea of a revolutionary project was to bring back into history. And I think, um, you know, I mean, in some ways it feels almost ridiculous to quote somebody as amazing uh, and as admirable when you're writing about, about such ridiculous figures. You know, you have a book that actually includes some references to Dave Rubin. I didn't spend that much time on Dave. I mean, there's some Dave dunking because it's funny. But if you're going to write a book that actually says we got to deal with some of the problems here, uh, you know, in terms of like these people's ideas, if you just focus on the weakest link all the time, it's, you know, it's not going to do the job. But it is funny. Doctors are demanding we turn over our supplies and masks to them, but they never have the guts to call out their bosses, the penny pinching MBA hospital administrators who've utterly failed to protect uh, them, yeah, I totally agree. Landlords, <laughs> let me put it to you this way, to the landlord one. There needs to be, and if you're calling people, you must, you must call your congressperson and say that there needs to be a rent freeze now. There needs to be a national rent freeze, 100%. 100%. People cannot be being demanded to pay rent now, period. And there's work on mortgages, but not works on 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 uh, rents. And we all know why, because of the class base of the system. Thanks for the Red Emma shout out. I'm gonna post the purchase link below. Solidarity from Baltimore. Thank you, brother. Buy, get your pre-order. Go to Red Emma's and get a pre-order of Against the Web, the cosmopolitan answer to the new right. That's definitely um, how all of my friends are ordering my new book. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a range. I think, you know, you'll find it entertaining because of the, you know, thorough critiques of all of these, you know, wankers. Um, but then there's this bigger argument that I'm trying to build of this idea of a cosmopolitan socialism that really builds, I think, a basis for a global and international solidarity that's materially demanded and dynamic and doesn't fall into all of the pitfalls of all of this, you know, horrible moralistic liberal discourse that has undermined us so much and been so profoundly damaging and ineffective the past couple of years. And then, you know, really again, I'm 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 taking it to them. It was very satisfying to finally write a full chapter 
on Sam Harris and, you know, all of his just awful, ridiculous work. And I know, I know, I can already, even in, even in the pandemic, I can already, you know, out of context, out of context. Well, thank you. Much appreciated to everybody who's order, already pre-ordered the book and I'll always put in my plug, definitely order it from our friends over at Red Emma's. I actually do think on the localism level, we really do need to think about how we can kind of, you know, look, your consumer choices are not the answer to politics and acquiring power. That is a destructive myth of neoliberalism. Zizek has a great critique of that. And at the same time, uh, where we're moving our personal uh, capital, we should be very considerate about. Yes, of course, it's definitely available on Amazon. It's available everywhere. If you wanna buy it on Kindle, you can buy it on Amazon. But I would really make an effort if you can to really put your money into community supported agriculture, worker cooperatives, and also just good, fine, independent businesses, period. It matters. It's part of the overall context. We look at the panoply of things we need to be looking at. Mutual aid, strikes, supporting Bernie Sanders, supporting Rashida, supporting you know the Workers' Party, various electoral efforts. Uh, and then we also need to look at how do we actually support various forms of local systems and dynamism? And that includes small and local businesses. That includes all of these various things. It even includes, it includes folks that do work like I do, um, frankly, on some level. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the incredible disparity between those of us doing independent media um, and the incredible power that still persists of corporate media. I mean, we've seen the incredible damaging effects of that in this, uh, you know, in this election, the way that they, the amount of propaganda, the amount of energy that they've been put towards uh, destroying Bernie, who's still in. Um, and he definitely needs to keep going, uh, for sure. Uh, so I really would think about that. Yeah. Um, well, as of now, we've switched the date till July. Um, and if you bought tickets to the Austin show, you can go to the venue and you can either switch or get a full refund. Obviously, I don't know. You know, I mean, look, in the most optimistic scenario, we'll do it. Uh, I certainly miss doing live shows and being on the road. It's fucking awesome. Um, I'm also excited going out and, you know, doing events for the book, but nobody's going anywhere now. And we're certainly not going to do any event or, or do anything until it's completely safe. And I think, you know, uh, obviously some aspects of this are, you know, it's going to take a really, really long time. The crisis wasn't dealt with promptly. It exploits underlying huge weaknesses in the system, the complete gutting of public health infrastructure. We don't have single payer universal health care in this country. Um, you know, it's starting to be contained, obviously, in places like China and South Korea, I think also Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. Um, but it's still, you know, an extraordinary disaster and tragedy in Europe. And it's, it's going to hit us in the United States extremely hard. And it's, it's just my, it is mind blowing. It is fucking, fucking mind blowing to see the Democratic leadership who obviously I have no respect for. I mean, people like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, the best thing they could do for the world is just retire and go away. But the fact that even they and Chuck Schumer have managed to allow Donald Trump, who let this whole thing become a catastrophe and has had nothing but nonsense to be at a 55% approval rating is an outrageous, dangerous disgrace. Uh, what can the left do to stop Obama from throwing his raid around swing races, races e.g. Keith Sanders and Ellison? Nothing. But I think we have to, again, very carefully and very gingerly um, be very clear about just how damaging and failed in many key respects the Obama record was. Let's be real. The Obama years were a massive missed opportunity that created the, all of the context for the global crisis we're in. Is it left giving up gap between Bernie is narrowing fast in the national polls? I would not give up. And I would strongly encourage Bernie, actually the way Bernie's campaigning right now is perfect. The campaign 
is doing solidarity around Corona. They're calling in, they're checking into people, they're getting money to Meals on Wheels, and Bernie's leading. Bernie's the only national leader who has an actual answer for all of this, who has actual plans, who says, give people 2,000 a month, stop rent, stop mortgages, get unemployment insurance uh, going. He's the only one with the leadership. He's the only one with the plan, and he must keep campaigning. I will say on the flip side, I would not be surprised if Democratic leaders who, you know, their secondary concern to stopping Bernie is maybe they want to be back in the White House. I think there's going to be a big push to replace Joe Biden with Andrew Cuomo, and I'd watch that. Fun fact, July 2009, Biden cut, pushed to cut uh, $151 billion from Medicare and Medicaid after the H1N1 outbreak while giving trillions of interest-free loans to Wall Street. How can we get the left to care about the judiciary? I don't know. I mean, look, it's something to care about. It's something to be aware of. Um, I think people obviously were very irresponsible about them in some ways. In other ways, the ship has, you know, has sailed. It, we need to somehow figure out a way of not completely going into, it doesn't matter, let Trump have the store, not make qualitative distinctions. We're never going to go there. It's not a smart way of doing politics. It's not serious analysis. And then at the same time, frankly, all of the old tropes of like, you know, oh, well, you got to vote for whoever because of, you know, this or that judicial appointment. It's not enough. There's plenty of people on the left who have not been remotely serious enough about that stuff, no doubt. And it's a legitimate criticism. And I think, frankly, even just looking at this election as, okay, well, you know, fuck Biden. Let's have, let's have Trump. I, I completely disagree with that. Completely disagree with that. And at the same time, this same old blue, no matter who kind of like, yeah, well, you can completely, you know, F us over in every way imaginable. Um, but, you know, here's a narrow thing you got to vote on. That's also not going to work. However, false equivalency isn't going to work. And I would actually say, as I've always said, look, I would vote in a swing state to get Donald Trump out of office. And especially... We just have William Barr asking for indefinite detentions of prisoners without trial. The right will use this crisis. And in a way, it would be better as a left to be failing, to be fighting a completely failed, dead, and, a, and exhausted neoliberalism, which does have authoritarian tendencies. Joe Biden, of course, has authoritarian record, but not a nimble and much smarter and much more effective right that actually has a governing vision for the 21st century. That's not the one that we want to be up against if we have absolutely no institutional power. So think about that. Will you vote for Biden? I don't want to. I live in New York. I probably won't. If I lived in a swing state, I probably would. Um, but again, I'll keep emphasizing, we need to ask the bigger questions. And one of the bigger questions now that is actually even different than a couple of weeks ago is in fact, the context of who we're voting for and the opportunity costs of a crisis. And do we want to hand that to, again, a right wing that is in power and actually thinking and actually has savvy and actually has charismatic leadership? Or do we say to ourselves, we understand that the Democratic Party leadership is a pure impediment, a pure impediment to any type of progress, period. And at the same time, if they're ineffective and bumbling um, versus marshaled and coherent and creating a new governing block, uh, we have to think in terms of what kind of keeps us out of the potential of power for a long time. So we need to be very strategic about this. And as I always say, I'm never, you know, that's my bottom line. I'm never not going to give you the strategic analysis. So I, I definitely, again, yes, if I was in a swing state, I'd vote for Biden. But I think that we need to ask the deeper, more serious questions about the context we're in. And part of the context we're in is that the right wing has a decades long governing consensus opportunity right now. And people need to be strategic about it. Look, I mean, you don't need to bombard me with what you don't do. Again, I don't, this is my thing, whether it's Warren or Stein or whatever, you know, cool, do what you feel, but I'm gonna tell you what it is. And what it is, is that 
there is a huge danger and very serious um, governing long-term potential of the right right now. And, and if there was an actual, look, if Bernie Sanders was actually going to go third party and take that risk, I'd 100% support that, 100%. A meaningless protest vote, I'm not gonna, you know, argue with you all about it, but I don't think there's any value to it. Uh, but I also think we need to, as I keep saying, we need to have the bigger conversations about how we actually um, micro-organize and how we think and work and innovate out of this, including with that framework of, of global interdependence, national delivery of social democracy and local resiliency. We have no idea what will happen as this plays out. We don't. People thought Trump definitely couldn't win. I think Trump will likely be reelected, but it's definitely not definite. I think it's better to give Trump a blue house and Senate and to protect over our courts while at the same time not voting for Biden. Eh, whatever. I mean, again, I'm just gonna be honest with you and give you the analysis. Uh, and at the same time, the Democratic elite is utterly failed, utterly dangerous. No one's doing more to help uh, reelect Biden than them, and they have no answer to any of this. So that's the predicament we're in. If Bernie would run third party, if that was a real thing, if there was a real context for it, I would 100% support that because now it is the time that we would need to actually take risks like that. But that's a strategic risk with maybe a payoff. You know, random protest vote don't have that. Um, but I've already feel like we've already spoken too much about it anyways, uh, frankly. Um, and I really want everybody, if you can, to really help. Uh, yeah, I got it. I got it. Really, really help uh, Rashida Tlaib. Um, because she's facing a primary challenge. And we need to keep Rashida Tlaib in Congress. That's hugely important. That is hugely, hugely, hugely important. Um, so the book, and I will talk more specifically about the book the next couple of times. Tomorrow for patrons, there's another deep dive with Shreko that we recorded just for patrons. And then the three of us are gonna do a think tank, which we will uh, stream on YouTube for everybody to watch. That's gonna be with the whole gang. and. You know, hit us with your super chat questions and we'll just kind of talk and relax and hang out, try to all be together. Um, in some ways, you know, I'm thinking more comedy, more philosophy, more, you know, we got to laugh, got to breathe. We've also got to be really clear eyed and think our way out of all of this. Um, so at any rate, guys, if you can, now is a really good time to, it always is, become a patron, patreon.com slash TMDS if you can. If you're a patron, you need a deal, you need help, you wanna stay on, get all the content we're doing, let me know. I would start calling your Congress people and communicating about supporting the Rashida Tlaib plan, about supporting the Bernie Sanders proposals. I would also um, sign any petitions that you can on rent freezes, I would start talking with people about all sorts of various organizing of possibilities. You might have conversations with people about rent strikes. You might have conversations with people about any number of things. If you have old folks in a building near you and you can, if you feel safe, if you feel all right, offer to do their, buy their groceries for them. There's certainly people in my life that I'm very close to that I'm having to, you know, step in for and and uh hopefully i pray you know i'll stay uh, uh healthy and you know it's a lot cooking here and we all got to kind of learn that empathy um it's hard it goes against so much and uh, we're all you know going through it and hopefully we can also grow learn evolve do better uh, and help create this better politics. And yes, don't share, do not share joints. It's very clear. If you wanna, if you wanna smoke a friend out, get on FaceTime. <laughs>
you know, if you want to smoke with somebody during social isolation, light a spliff on FaceTime. It's very important to light a spliff on FaceTime. I think it's also really, really key. Yeah, I'm going to do more of that. You can just start hitting me with super chats tomorrow for impressions and shit. We need to laugh. Look, you need to focus like a hawk with what's going on in Congress and the executive branch because it's really fucking dangerous. We need to encourage Bernie like hell to keep running because he needs to. We need to fight for the Rashida bill. We need to be calling Pelosi and Schumer. I might, I'm, you know, if you can help out, uh, you know, Shahid, uh, you know, Buttar running against Nancy Pelosi. Um, it's really important, but we're also going to get to the big picture, more conversations with people like Adolf Reed and Joshua Kahn and Shreko. And let's, uh, uh yeah, we gotta, we gotta have some, uh, you know, I remember I was at a Cypress Hill concert and it was the first time I was passing a blunt to the left. And, you know, it was just, it was an incredible time because I always thought to myself, wouldn't Bobby Kennedy, he would be more Cypress Hill, wouldn't he? Everybody thought Bobby Kennedy would be a Wu-Tang guy, but I thought Bobby would be a Cypress Hill guy. <laughs> Tip O'Neill liked the Fugees. <laughs> guys don't remember Cypress Hill? Jesus Christ. I still like Mandela Warren. I'm really into... I will no longer be fighting to end apartheid because Steve Biko was rude to me at a meeting and I am going to take several weeks in Johannesburg for self-care. I am going to take several weeks in Johannesburg. Oh, small country lawyer, that was, uh, that was Rudy. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve, Steve Baker was very rude. And so therefore, I can no longer fight apartheid. Uh, what was country lawyer? That was Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, because Rudy Giuliani said in one of his Fox interviews that he was just like a simple country lawyer. Right, I remember that. I thought there would be room for me in the African National Congress electoral race, even though I lied about my tribal affiliation until I was over 50 and actually invite and actually advised the Nationalist Party. I thought that I would be able, it would actually would be really funny if there was somebody like that, that just like ran against Mandela, just like didn't do anything to fight apartheid forever. And then just like, it's like, I would like to challenge Nelson Mandela for the leadership of the African National Congress. I apologize for pretending I was Sony. Uh, anybody, yeah, also if, yeah, if people get offended by impressions and stuff, definitely a good time to self exit the chat. You should definitely self isolate because we do fun, uh, for sure. Um, everybody should read, uh, the, um, yeah. Self-isolate from the fun. What? Do, yes. I've heard of Cypress Hill and I'm 25. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, everybody should read, um, the, uh, great intercept piece about the, uh, ghoul who funded Elizabeth Warren's super PAC. It was like everything you'd expect. Everything you'd expect. It was perfect. So, I have one funder for my super PAC. Yeah. <laughs> Nelson Mandela plagiarized Long Walk to Freedom. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember Rudy Giuliani was just like, hey, I'm just a small town fucking lawyer from Bensonhurst. I mean, when you realize that, like, Rudy Giuliani is just like an evil asshole version of Joe Pesci and my cousin Vinny, then it's like, that's it. Bernie Sanders is mob deep, please, Don. I would say I've 
Joe Biden shook if I thought that Joe Biden was still alive. I would like to do an emergency conference broadcast with Joe Biden about Corona if, in fact, Joe Biden is still alive. I doubt Bernie would become Senate Majority Leader. Bill Clinton, as Chuck Schumer. Hmm. Joe, are you alive? I thought because I didn't shake your hand before the debate <laughs> that you might, in fact, still be alive. <laughs> you know what I think all this video conference bullshit is, Joe? I think it's malarkey. Uh, yeah, Chuck Schumer, Chuck, Jesus Christ, these people. I, I still don't have a Biden yet, actually. It's a tough one. Shit, I'm 25 and I've seen, and yes, yeah, seen, and yeah, she's a scene cut Cypress Hill. Cypress Hill is classic. What are the chances Corona fades? What are the chances that Corona fades such that Ch uh, Trump is able to claim it, uh, re uh, ride it to re-election? Uh, it's possible. It's possible. I honestly doubt it. It's not gonna fade in six or eight months. Why has the left ever been able to bring its coalition together? Because of everything Adolf Reed writes about. That's why we need to watch all the interviews with Adolf Reed and read class notes. And also to add, I think some of the spiritual stuff that Joshua Kahn and I talk about too. Um, trying to think, maybe, uh, maybe L MLK Joe Biden. It's like, Come on, man. Oh, I'll tell you what. Oh, oh, you're saying I said, I'll smack you in the motherfucking face. Mm. Just spitballing here. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys, we're going to do a lot. Um, we are going to do a lot tomorrow. We're going to have a, I'm not sure what time yet, but we're going to publicly stream a think tank. There's going to be a, uh, episode, a second conversation with Shreko for, uh, the patrons. And next week there's going to be a two part patron series with Joshua Khan. There's obviously going to be the main show on Tuesday, um, and a bunch of additional live streams, including, uh, a series I'm going to start where I'm going to go over various chapters in my book against the web cosmopolitan answer to the new, right? Go order it today. It's on pre-order. It's going to come out April 28th. Trying to figure out who we are as the Sanders movement going forward. Uh, for sure, it's just the Democrats or the squad. No, it's it's got to be much bigger and much more. It's got to be much more institutional than those things. And I'm actually going to have on Ronan Burton Shaw from the Tribune. We just had a great conversation. I did an interview in Tribune, which will actually be published pretty soon. And we were talking about the advantages the UK left has over the US and the advantages the US has over the UK left. And the US has the advantage of more successful uh, politician and candidate right now in Bernie than in Corbyn. And on the other hand, in the UK, even though it's been decimated, they still have real actual union power. And none of these things can be done without serious global across the board union power centered around common material in, uh, interests in shared, clear language for the many, 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 many. That's the only way it's going to happen. All right, guys, much love. Appreciate you all. Stay safe. Deep breaths. Stay safe. I'll keep reiterating. Um, we're thinking of you. Um, may everybody be safe. May everybody be happy. May everybody be healthy. Love you all. Much love. Much appreciation. Okay?